Ladies and gentlemen, I am the American. Welcome back to the channel. If I may have a quick word with you, bookmarks below, but if I may have a quick word, the reason I chose to write a Nirvana Unplugged review was because the Alice in Chains Unplugged review was received so positively. Now, it's not the most highly viewed video I've ever had. It is the most positively received video. If you haven't watched it, watch it, or at least just go read the comments. People really liked that review, so I thought, you know what, I wanna write another review. When I write these reviews, all I'm really doing is writing an essay. I'm researching a subject and writing an essay. How appropriate that the good folks over at essaypro.com reached out to me to sponsor this video. Now, in case you've never heard of them, Essay Pro is a high quality paper writing service. The writers at EssayPro.com are basically linguistic geniuses. They come from the US, they come from UK and Canada. They guarantee the highest quality results. They guarantee that no two papers are alike. Most importantly, they guarantee absolutely no plagiarism. Every single paper is original. They are happy to revise the paper if you're not happy. It all comes with the money back guarantee, starting out at 11 dollars a page but use my personalized link type in the promo code american spy fox get it done with just a quick click away down in the description check one two check check one two check one two check 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 Can we get on with this for like an hour late? The average low temperature in New York City in November is 41 degrees. You can count on a cold snapping wind and a slight drizzle this time of year that keeps most residents bundled and locked away within their warm, cozy flats and efficiency apartments. But on the evening of November 18, 1993, a small, very lucky group of New York City residents, friends and family would emerge from the comfort of their homes to embark on a journey for a night they'd soon know they'd never forget. Those fortunate few would be the first to discover just how flexible their favorite reluctant rock star really was. They would come to cherish a music they never even knew they liked. Prior to the recording of Nirvana's Live in New York at Sony Music Studios, the band had been beating the pavement, touring city to city, venue to venue, with a new twist to their live performances. While journalists were busy flooding the media with rumors of the band breaking up, Nirvana was busy as ever, on tour with the Meat Puppets, honing a new style for their audiences, one that many greed-filled white-collar executives sitting high and mighty in their DGC offices worried would never work out in their favor. In other words, this new style Kurt Cobain was showing to his fans wouldn't line their pockets. Like most decisions Kurt Cobain made, everyone was just waiting for it to blow up in his face. It seemed the whole world believed Nirvana could assail no higher, and they would soon find out the only way to go from here was down. The executives at MTV were no different. When Nirvana's crew handed MTV producer Alex Coletti their set list, he complained that there were few hits, and even worse, Kurt was going to gamble their last unplugged show of the year on Meat Puppets covers, making MTB even more nervous was rehearsals, or lack thereof. The band never actually sat down and rehearsed the entire show, only a few songs they were still hashing out, so what counted as a rehearsal was squeezed in the day of November 17th, only one day before the show was scheduled for recording on November 18th. MTV producer Alex Coletti griped that there wasn't enough time while Rolling Stone music journalists were busy cultivating an image of Kurt Cobain the slacker, Kurt Cobain the druggie, and Kurt Cobain the resistant rock star. One issue they worried about was the drummer. No amount of begging him seemed to get through to his head. Over and over they asked him, Dave, please play quieter. Please play quieter. 
Dave, you have to play quieter. Ironically, what originally attracted Chris and Kurt to Dave's drumming was his power. Now Chris was expressing concern over the hard hitter. Did you have to alter your style much for this show? I mean, it's for television, and did Dave have to like hold back on his drumming? And oh yeah, totally. We were like telling him, oh, we're gonna put wrap you in a glass capsule. A last minute purchase of drum brushes seemed to resolve the issue. I was really worried about Dave Grohl. Dave is a heavy drummer. I had sent a PA out to a music store to get brushes and these things they call sizzle sticks, they're little percussive sticks, they're a bunch of dowels wrapped together and they're much softer. So I don't know what came over me, it was around the holidays, I took some wrapping paper, I wrapped it up and when Grohl came in I said, like, Merry Christmas. And he opened it up and he goes, wow, I never had brushes before, cool. Then there was the question of Kurt's well-known addiction problems. MTV worried Kurt might not show up if he was in withdrawal, so they'd made a behind the scenes, off the record decision to purchase some Valium from a local corrupt pharmacist. Not exactly what Kurt needed, but Valium does curb the effects of withdrawal. They hoped it'd be enough to get him through the performance. The execs at MTV were coming down hard on Nirvana's management, Gold Mountain, wanting guarantees that Cobain would be well enough to perform at full health. Like so many others in that early Seattle scene, Cobain had succumbed to self-medication. They feared that Cobain the slacker was going to ruin the show. It would all be a huge waste of time, a huge waste of money. Kurt wasn't taking it serious, they complained, and Cobain loved every last minute of it. He loved to make them think there's no big payday at the end of this rainbow. The truth was, Kurt Cobain always knew exactly what he was doing and exactly where he was heading. He had been preparing himself for the show. He just liked to rattle the white color types whenever he could, says Amy Fennerty, an MTV employee who was an early champion of Nirvana, pushing the Smells Like Teen Spirit video on them when they were only playing it late at night during their alternative show, 120 Minutes. It was Amy Fennerty who really got Nirvana into the mainstream video rotation. Although Kurt did not share this with MTV for obvious reasons, he had already made arrangements for a delivery to come, along with his Kentucky Fried Chicken. He only sent one of his inner circle to MTV complaining as another way to fuck with them. And as far as being prepared for the show, Cobain had purposefully chosen to rehearse for the Unplugged show while out on tour, killing two birds with one stone, interweaving a new softer side of Nirvana, a soulful acoustic set, into their usual cynical adaptation of punk rock. While the fans stood by Cobain and his band of misfits, encouraging them to go acoustic. What am I expecting? Just, just like chaos, but acoustic chaos. It's beautiful. What kind of sound do you think a punk band like Nirvana can do acoustically? <laughs> Everything they can do electrically. The white collars believed it would be an all-day event of missed cues and rolled tape. It turned out Nirvana would have to perform each song only once. So well prepared they were. In fact, it'd be the only MTV Unplugged performance where what you see is what you got. No other band had been able to pull off their entire set list without a retake. Fuck! You guys just get to hear more, that's all. Only the so-called slacker who was going to ruin everything accomplished that feat. When Kurt Cobain and company pulled into New York City on November 17th, only one day before the recording, only themselves and their closest confidants knew that they were well prepared. When MTV asked Sonic Youth's Lee Ronaldo what he thought was going to happen with the performance, he said, Oh, I think it's great. I think a lot of their songs are going to work really well on acoustic instruments. I'm really looking forward to it. It sounds pretty good, the acoustic stuff. I mean, it's kind of hard to put that over 
to a big crowd of fans that are waiting to mosh, you know. But the recent shows, they've been interspersing them. It's, it's been really nice. They're really good. It's a really good change of pace. Unfortunately for Nirvana fans, MTV chose to not record the band on the 17th. In 2000, the Nirvana fan club interviewed MTV producer Alex Coletti. Their first question being, is there any footage from the 17th rehearsal? And if so, will that footage ever be released? Coletti responded that no footage existed and that the day was quite uneventful. He added that Kurt seemed a little nervous about the upcoming performance, while Groen Novoselic seemed hardly affected at all. Okay, what are you looking forward to most about Unplugged? All to show off our softer side, like, like scented toilet paper. As prepared as Kurt knew he was, this should come as no surprise. Anyone in his leadership position would have had butterflies in their stomach. After all, all eyes would be front and center, barreling down at the front man who would ultimately determine the night's success or failure. Strip a band down to its core and at the center is nothing more than lyrics and vocals. By all accounts, Kurt was nervous. The setting was as intimate as any punk rock nightclub, the audience within reach surrounding the band on three sides. And this nightclub would be broadcasted to the entire world. Self-appointed judges judge more than they have sold. For a guy who so many claimed was self-conscious and depressed, he sure never showed it. Kurt met the audience with the kind of stoic confidence only before seen at the start of an early Mike Tyson fight, like Dave Chappelle speaks of the way he feels before every live comedy show. Yeah, I'm sure this is going to be good. Cobain had something for us that we never knew we liked, and we never knew he had. Cobain knew what he was capable of even if before Unplugged, we did not. The red light turns on, the applaud signal turns off, quieting the audience to a dead silence. Kurt takes a second to gather himself, stone-faced, a little uneasy, but exuding confidence. This is off our first record. Most people don't own it. The song Kurt refers to is about a girl, the melodic Beatles tune from the band's original 1988 album, Bleach. In case you didn't know, this wasn't just about any girl, but the first girl any man falls in love with and finds himself unable to measure up to her expectations. In those days, Kurt spent most days holed up in a tiny efficiency apartment he shared with his first love, Tracy Miranda hardly bothering to wash his hair, let alone change out of his pajamas. So busy he was enveloped in his art and the music he was creating that would one day change the world. Tracy worked as many shifts as she could at the local airport to support herself and her aspiring musician boyfriend, but the mundane repetitiveness of the 9 to 5 grind over time wore her down. She'd often leave reminder notes for Kurt, encouraging him to take on some of the responsibility of independent living. Kurt, don't forget to wash the dishes. Kurt, don't forget to feed the cat. Kurt, take a fucking shower. In the end, the responsibility of caring not only for herself, but another human being entirely, all the while trying to maintain a clean living environment, took its toll on Tracy. She grew impatient and weary of Kurt's incessant untidiness and decided to kick him out. Of the apartment. Kurt made it as far as the car outside, spending several nights in the proverbial doghouse before Tracy calmed down enough to start feeling sorry for him. She explained to him that after all she'd done for Kurt to keep him warm and fed, all the while encouraging and nurturing his artistic ambitions, after all the love and attentiveness she'd showed him, all she really wanted from him was for him to write her a song. Inevitably, she would let Kurt back in the house, but not before he'd grown somewhat hurt and resentful of her actions. Cobain would immortalize Tracy with his own frustrations over their strange relationship by pinning the words, I can't see you every night, for free.
Kurt finish the outcast song from the ultra-grungy riff record Bleach, he made it a point to give the camera a sarcastic smile. Kurt had given a heads up to MTV Unplugged producer Alex Coletti that he was tired of seeing himself portrayed as a somber, depressed little Jesus Pisces man, and that he was going to give a big smile that he wanted captured in a close-up, caught on film, for the final edit. In true Cobain fashion, he did not fail to add sarcasm mixed with cynicism to that smile. Kurt once said in an interview that he could laugh through an entire photo shoot, but inevitably, the one photo the magazine would use would be the one second he wasn't smiling. Knowing this, it's not hard to surmise why Kurt would add cynicism to that close-up smile. At the time, Cobain was right. Most people didn't own their first record. Originally, Bleach only sold around 40,000 copies. Still, Bruce Pavitt once told Mark Arm of Mudhoney that Bleach was the only record in their catalog that was selling, which kept Sub Pop afloat in those early days from going totally tits up. As for today, Bleach has become a 2 million copy unit shifter, one of Cobain's favorite ways to describe popular music that makes the white collars money. Unit shifter. Words that if I had to guess, Kurt and Chris discovered on some bigwig sales projections sheet, Radio Friendly Unit Shifter would become an inside joke among the band and a killer track on their experimental Back to the Basics album, In Utero. It would not be until well after his demise with the release of Nirvana Live in New York that most people would be introduced to the melodic About a Girl for most becoming the definitive version as it proved to be the perfect opener for a night that went down in rock and roll history, originally only being outsold by Alice in Chains' own unplugged record, but over time, catching up and surpassing it. Without commentary, perhaps for the first time showing some of that pre-show nervousness that Alex Coletti talked about, Kurt launches into the second song of the evening, Coincidentally, the second single released off the band's second album, Nevermind, and their second and final American Top 40 hit that needed no introduction. Come as you are, as you were, as I want you to be, as a friend, as an old enemy. It would be one of very few hits Nirvana would play that night, in a mainstream venue where most bands, including Kurt's favorite, R.E.M., would busy themselves busting out their entire hit list, Kurt chose a different, unique route for his own unplugged performance. But as he sang this fan favorite song, you can tell he really meant it. Choosing to sing in key but with a raspy, guttural precision that few vocalists can achieve. can be coached into singing on key, but try screaming on key. That's a rare talent very few possess. Lennon comes to mind, Chris Cornell, Lane Staley. That's about it. Take your time. Hurry up. Choice is yours. Don't be late. Kurt sticks his tongue out before licking his lips and offers a quiet thank you. Number three, Jesus don't want me for a sunbeam. Chris Novoselic hands the drummer Dave Grohl an acoustic guitar and then straps on what my teenage rocker mind thought of as some kind of old-timey instrument, in other words, an accordion. For those who'd never had the opportunity to see Nirvana live over the last few preceding months where they'd changed up their concerts by mixing in acoustic covers, this was a big surprise. What? The drummer plays guitar? The bassist plays, well... Whatever that thing is, it's hard to overstate the shock and awe this rearrangement of the band had on both casual and original fans alike. There was no internet at that time, well, none worth a damn anyways, no YouTube, no way to see Nirvana perform aside from their music videos or actually getting up and going to a concert, and even then, 
That's only if you were lucky enough to live near a venue they played at. Most people's idea of Nirvana was a mega punk thrashathon that ended in instrument executions. Dave Grohl wasn't Dave fucking Grohl, he was David, the luckiest drummer in the world who got the gig with Nirvana right before they made it big. No one had any clue the guy could play guitar too. As for Chris, he was so quirky that I'm not sure anyone was surprised to see him strap on an accordion. It's such a big world, you know? It's a small world. It's kind of a medium-sized world. Things were getting very interesting. If that wasn't enough, Kurt introduces Lori Goldstein, a world-class celloist who'd accompanied Nirvana on the latest tour just for those special acoustic moments. David Grohl, who we've discovered has a microphone, turns to his left and chimes in. And this is our new guitar player, Pat. It finally clicked in my teenage mind. Oh, so that's the guy who sings back up, harmonizing with Kurt's tracks on Nevermind. I'd always thought it was Cobain harmonizing with himself. I begin to have a little more respect for Grohl as an all-around musician. Kurt adds, he's an honorary punk rocker. Honorary indeed. Pat already had his own claims to punk rock glory before he'd ever joined Nirvana. For one, in his youth, he'd somehow befriended original rocker Joan Jett, a BFF relationship that persists to this day, and probably a big part of the reason why Joan was there to honor Kurt during Nirvana's Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony. He'd even lived with Joan in West Hollywood when he was too broke to afford his own apartment. Back then, punk rock only paid just enough to get you a little food, a little beer, and some gas to the next venue. Pat's original band, The Germs, could hold their own, but weren't pumping out any radio-friendly unit shifters. So Pat cut a big break by finding a patron in Joan Jett. Pat had also appeared in a now legendary documentary about punk rock called The Decline of Western Civilization. But other than that, he was a tremendous rhythm guitar player. His rhythm was as reliable as Grohl's metronome-like timing, and according to Kurt, a lot of fun to be around. Cobain would expand on Pat's background by jokingly adding, he likes Queen more though. Being a Taylor Hawkins fan for many years, I am reminded of how highly regarded Queen was to him as well. Makes a person wonder if being a big Queen fan is a prerequisite to joining the Foo Fighters. Even Daughter Girl's first performance ever was drumming to Queen's We Will Rock You. <laughs> Kurt goes on to explain they're about to perform a cover of a song written by the Vaselines. And he says it so matter-of-factly as if the viewer ought to already know who the Vaselines are. Never once throughout his entire set, many songs being covers, does Cobain speak of any group as if they are more or less than Nirvana or each other. He credits Bowie in the same tone as he credits the Vaselines, and this is a virtue that has endured throughout Cobain's legacy. His modesty has been a characteristic of his that has transcended generations of fans who adore him for it. Perhaps more closely guarded by his fans who carry on his legacy than his music, Kurt Cobain was a man of the people, for the people. Someone who, though at first didn't know how to deal with his superstardom, still carried himself with humility after realizing he was the biggest deal of the 90s, worth a literal fortune. Kurt sang, Jesus don't want me for a sunbeam. Sunbeams are never made like me. You get the sense that Kurt Cobain thinks of himself as an incomplete, imperfect human being, that he truly believes it. Honestly, it was refreshing to feel connected to a person who had assailed such heights who still had issues with himself. So many celebrities, especially rock stars, let it all go to their heads, but with Kurt, you got the feeling that he was just a regular guy with regular guy problems. I watched an interview with Johnny Depp recently within a documentary about the 90s. Depp said, It just wasn't cool to like being famous in the 90s. I realized at this moment why all celebrities in LA, at least 
tried to pretend they didn't love being famous in the 90s. They were all following Cobain's lead. Cobain didn't think it was cool to be famous, and he's the coolest fucking guy on the planet. So they all pretended to be like him, like Kurt. Movie stars followed his lead. With Kurt, you knew it wasn't make-believe. And if there really is a Jesus, and he really uses the souls of good-hearted people to make sunbeams, I like to think that Kurt is shining down through one of them. Next on the set list is the man who sold the world. Kurt warns the crowd, I guarantee you I will screw this song up. It gets a small laugh from the audience. More of that modesty showing. We passed upon the stair, spoke of was and when. Although I wasn't there, he said I was his friend. I don't know why, but every time I hear this song, I think of Kurt's dad, Donald Cobain. Maybe that's because of the feeling of loss and abandonment the song demands of the listener. I wonder if Kurt chose this song because it reminded him of his own abandonment. His father remarrying after promising he never would moving her children into the house, and exiling Kurt to live in the dampened mildew basement by himself. Sometimes there really is a comfort in being sad. Did this song bring up these old resentments? I'm not sure. By this time, Don Cobain had sought Kurt out during a Seattle concert. They spoke for quite a while, but in the end, Kurt told his father he'd outgrown the desire or need for any father-son parental bond. He had a daughter of his own now, and that was his only concern not trying to reignite a bond he needed long ago when it mattered. I just want you to know that I don't hate you anymore. There was nothing I could say that I haven't thought before. They agreed not to speak anymore. Kurt would play the song masterfully, his lead solo dancing over top the melody Pat Smear provided him. was rarely spoken of in the media about Nirvana was that they were a well-oiled machine. They rehearsed until their fingers bled and then rehearsed some more. When it came to art and music, Kurt Cobain's work ethic would stand up to any modern billionaire's supposed work ethic. It's a shame that he never gets credit for all the time and practice he put into his craft. Most people still think it was all innate skill that he did nothing to achieve his level of songwriting abilities and that he blew his God-given talent by choosing an easy way out. This couldn't be further from the truth. Kurt Cobain was a workaholic. His repetitive drive and dedication to practice is what gained him the abilities to make such soul-reaching music. Don Cobain once told a story about a time he and some family members took Kurt fishing. They all spread out around the lake to find their own spots, but before too long they could hear Kurt screaming the most peculiar sounds. Believing he was hurt and trying to cry for help, Don and others came running to find Kurt beating his chest and making the most absurd sounds. When asked what the hell he was doing, Cobain explained that he was practicing singing and screaming at the same time. These talents weren't just given to him. However unorthodox his black sheep methods were to others, he was working toward a goal. To this day, Dave Grohl will tell you Kurt never asked if his band wanted to play a song. He'd just start playing it, and when they ran out of songs, he'd start all over again. We're talking about a guy who'd play guitar up to nine hours a day. If you believe that's not work, that it's just all fun, try it and see how your fingers and forearms feel afterwards. With that kind of dedication to his craft, it's no wonder he didn't screw the song up. Okay, but here's another one I could screw up. What is it? Am I gonna do this by myself? What is it? <laughs> 